Uh, April Sayers on this balmy summer evening. Uh, thanks for you to, thanks for you leaving your videos and your TVs behind to get here tonight. We have a fantastic lineup tonight. We have Isabel Bermudez, Jenny Ridley, um, Project Adorno, Patrick Hunane. Um, if you've not been to the Poetry Cafe before, um, just to let you know, um, you probably found the bar and cafe upstairs, the loser at the back. The organisers ask you not to take your drinks into the street because the neighbours complain, but I'm sure there aren't too many neighbours around on a night like this to complain, so hopefully everything will go smoothly. Um, and the show will be in two halves of about 40 minutes, so there's a nice break in the middle to refresh your glasses. So, um, without more ado, I'm going to kick off the evening. I'm Patrick Cunane, and you're very welcome to the Poetry Cafe. I'm going to start with um, a few poems from my latest collection, which is called Looking for Eden. And this first one, I was in Havana, and um, I visited um, John Lennon Park, and... Uh, in the park there's a bench with a statue of John Lennon, a bronze statue with his arm draped over the back. Um, as you approach the statue, the park keeper comes towards you and offers you a pair of spectacles to put on the statue so you can have a picture with the great man. And it seems that um, the reason the park keeper is there guarding the spectacles is because tourists have normally uh, in the past taken them as souvenirs. <coughs> so, uh, but in any case, um, Cuba must be the only country in the world where someone is employed as the keeper of John Lennon's glasses. <laughs> Out of the shade steps the keeper of John Lennon's glasses, slips them over the ex-Beatles bronze ears. I shove up next to the great man, put my arm around his shoulders, made too warm by the heat of the sun. You capture the moment when I meet John Lennon's likeness in Havana. A life-size casting on a bench, one leg draped casually over the other. I attempt to swap specs, but the keeper wags his finger. I take a moment to bless John for his life in my life. I place a coin in the keeper's palm in recognition of the sacred task he has been anointed so to do. It's not every day you meet the keeper of John Lennon's glasses. Let me take you down. <laughs> um, I was flying back from Amsterdam and um, the girl um, sitting next to me offered me a biscuit. And she was Dutch. And so this is Biscuit Girl from Amsterdam. <laughs> Would you like a biscuit? said the girl sitting next to me on the plane from Amsterdam. Her teeth so white. I think she must eat only apples. I appreciatively take one, crunch away. They are like our English biscuit, the hobnob, I say. <laughs> Her eyes widen, the obnob. Those white teeth again, as she seriously digests this important information. <clears throat> we call them country cookies, she says at last. Isn't that funny, I think, obnob. Sounds much Dutcher than country cookies. <laughs> she is on her way to Nepal, where neither obnobs nor country cookies can easily be found. Instead, she will digest the thrill of exploring fresh lands, a world experienced through young senses, opening like a giant lotus obnob in any flavour you like. <laughs> Um, so, I was travelling in northern India, we were on a train going towards Calcutta, it's an overnight journey, uh, the Rajani Express, and the young woman sitting in the opposite uh, bunk was a classical dancer, Indian classical dancer, on her way to a gig in Calcutta, and as the night, long night wore on, we, we talked about our respective art forms, and um, so this is Overnight on the Rajani Express. What kind of poetry do you write? said the Indian princess. A live dancer's body leaning forward with interest. Her meltingly dark eyes shining in the dim glow of the cabin. A river of hair shimmering as she speaks. 
What kind of poetry do you write? She commands an answer. I long to say, I write only the kind that aches for you, that mourns your unattainability and celebrates your fabulous beauty. But I tell her that my poetry is about life and love and politics and the ordinary moments that keep us sane or threaten our sanity with their insanity. The Indian princess nods, a world of understanding in her eyes. She returns to meditating while the train rattles through this strange and magical night. Sudden bridges and rivers emerging out of darkness. A lit boat moving slowly across a wide bay. A building picked out in red lights. The mysteriousness of it all. The Indian princess lying in her bunk. Her graceful body barely rising as she sleep breathes. And the world turning its poverty and its richness in tune with the sing-song rhythm of the wheels. So, um, I'm a vegetarian and um, this is just a little poem about the results um, the result of being a vegetarian can have sometimes. Uh, it's called Baked Aubergine Firemen. The firemen had just finished a rich baked aubergine dish when the call came. By now many faced emergencies of their own. That's the way it can be with vegetarian food. On the way to the fire, they stopped at McDonald's. Customers were surprised to see 12 firemen rushing in ignoring the meal deals, satisfying their needs, rushing out again. You know what it's like with aubergines, one yelled by way of explanation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, these are a couple of more recent poems, and this one is um, just reflecting on the way that uh, workplaces have changed, and anybody who's worked in an office uh, from, from the past may recognise how much they've changed to how they are now. So this is the, the old office. It felt solid, the old office. Workers bashing typewriters where personnel now surf the net. Spam curdling in the bin, blinds to keep the greyness in. You could count on its blockiness, lockable cabinets, no valuables inside. The station recovered in Aladdin's cave for secret poets. Lunchtime routines, swilling it back in the pub. Plates of greasy grub, none of your prat in a manger. So many changes. <laughs> we used to come in Saturday mornings. Wages arrived in brown envelopes. Cash was king. Best not spend it all on a weekend fling. Yes, Grandad, and was the office solid? Oh, it was solid all right. Workers bashing typewriters, where personnel now surfed the net. The ladies' perfume losing out to the fumes of booze and reek of fags. It was a ripe enough time for us old lags. Mm. <laughs> and this is um, the last poem of my first set. And uh, I grew up in a place near a place called Happy Valley, which is a wonderful green downs um, on the edge of Catrum. And I uh, went there one summer um, to have a picnic, and I was uh, reading some Byron um, while I was there. So this is Lord Byron in Happy Valley. <laughs> Lord Byron picnics in Happy Valley, full of suds and vim. He bounds through the bluebell woodland, so quick on his feet you can barely see him go. Byron munches a cheese roll, alert to the possibility of gherkin, which he hates, snaps the ring pull on a cream soda, dashes off an ode or two. For it is the dreaming time, April's loveliness has come shyly knocking. Poets are aware that love is their calling, and Byron is no exception. Byron lays back, half gazes at the cerulean sky, it's the doing of a being almost as great as he. 
but one that not so treasured by generations of schoolgirls writing in the margins. Byron beckons his love. Come, let's stride to the alehouse. Quaff a draught in late afternoon. We will have none of that pie. It is truth we seek, not gravy. <laughs> Okay, um, our second performer tonight.